My name's Nick Ashburn, and I am from Austin, Texas. And I'm here to talk to you about design thinking. And I don't, how many of you have ever heard of design thinking or human-centered design? So a few of you. Um, that's me when I was at IDEO.org. IDEO is a social innovation design firm, and they actually did, used to do product design, first and foremost. They created the mouse for Apple. They created the first laptop and a, you know, a plethora of other, other designs. But they spun off IDEO.org, which their stated mission was to alleviate poverty through design. And so my job when I was at IDEO.org was to spread the gospel of design thinking. So I think I'm fulfilling my mission here. But also um, to really instill how can we introduce the concepts to design to, uh, to address social issues. And what I'm so passionate about personally is innovation and collaboration. And that's why I'm so excited to be here at Weekend in Boca 6. So I studied politics. I lived in Washington, D.C. I've worked in international development. And in eight years, nine years, I've lived in Kansas, Nashville, Germany, Austria, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, San Francisco. So I've seen a wide variety of social issues in a lot of different contexts. In terms of you know, the problems that we're all trying to address here, how often do we look for silver bullets? You know, we are looking for that one key thing that's going to solve a problem. And I know everyone in this room is smarter than that, but for, from the policy side, from the funding side, I think that's what everyone's looking for. And how many have we found? Zero. So, you know, everyone in here understands that what we're dealing with here, it's complex, it's messy, and to, in order to be successful, it's going to require more than one single product, service, or program. And that's really where collaboration can play a huge, huge role. And innovation. We have to be innovative. We, it's no longer acceptable for us to just rest on our laurels. You know, we're all trying to do good. We are innovative in our own right, usually. But for some reason, there often are roadblocks. And we kind of get in this, into this mindset that says, I can't do this because the funding's not there. Or we tried this, and that doesn't really work. And I'm, I'm personally not OK with that. I say we have to push forward. We have to be, be stronger. We are all committed to making these issues either go away, or you know, how can we make a difference? And so why innovation? I want to frame this conversation in terms of value. And I think that really goes to some of the things that Jay and Mary uh, mentioned. For me, innovation is where we actually cap capture opportunity and increase our value. In the private sector, that's measured by profit. You know, If we're successful and there's more money coming in, that means that we're creating a value out there in the marketplace that people are responding to. But in the social sector, that's social impact. That's measured by social impact. And so we really have to evaluate, OK, if, if I'm trying to create value, then what are my metrics to do that? And what, what am I actually trying to address? And I feel like traditionally, we often do incremental improvements. We have a program that exists. And kind of when we understand that it's not really working, we say, how do we fix that? Well, innovation isn't really about that. We're saying, OK, what value can we create to our beneficiaries that will really have an impact instead of just kind of tweaking the model and changing it? And in the social sector or the civil society sector, we also are usually pretty linear in our thinking. We say, we have a great idea, or we think it's a great idea. And we usually ask for funding. We apply for grants. We look for donations to fund that idea so we can then go implement it on the ground. Design thinking is a little different. And I really want to focus here on identifying our value and then in, and being able to innovate on those ideas. 
For me, I have this picture up here because it's about peeling back the onion. It's not about just finding the answer or answers, but about asking the right questions. For me, it's, you know, there are two key questions. One, who is it that I'm trying to serve? Who are our beneficiaries? You know, are we looking to help disaster victims? Are we in low-income housing? Are we tackling education? But, you know, who is the end user of whatever service that we're providing? It could be a student. It could be families. It doesn't matter. Then you say, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? Okay, if I understand the people that I'm serving, what are their needs? Where can I create value to help them? Start with the people. That will lead you to the problem. You know, if I sat in this room and talked to each and every one of you, I'd get a really good idea of what you're facing in your daily lives and how maybe if I have value to add to your life, I would figure out how I could play a role in that. But instead, we often just say, okay, I have an idea, or there's this pain point, this something that really bothers me and that I really want to address. And so I say, what's the solution to that? Okay, I have the idea, now I need to execute on that, and then I'm going to see if I'm successful. Instead, we start with this deeper understanding of the people that we're trying to solve. Usually, you know, that creates new insights, and based on those insights, we're able to capture value. And I'm going to go through that in a little more detail. And by the way, I don't know what the system is for asking questions. We have a set Q&A, but usually my sessions are much more interactive. I didn't know we were going to have this set up, so I'd rather have it as a conversation than just me blabbing on for 45 minutes. Great. So, of course, my topic here is design thinking for social innovation. Now, what the heck is that? Design thinking is a process that begins with gaining deep, under, deep empathy and understanding a customer's needs, hopes, and aspirations for the future. I say customers. In our context, it can be beneficiaries, but it is that end user of our product and service. It also helps us understand not only the people and their needs, because if I went and asked you, I said, what is your need? You might say something. But if I really was in your home observing you day to day, I might understand that there's something else at play here that really we need to address first. And so when we're thinking of any social ill, we, can, we really need to go a little deeper than just asking. And so we really want to understand what context are we playing in here? I was introduced as this is an idea around creative problem solving, and I really stick to that. I also stick to the fact that this is a mindset. I'm not giving you a how-to guide. I'm really excited that you all are going to have an interactive session with the innovation guys later on, because I think you're going to have a context here and a theoretical framework, maybe, and be able to apply that later this afternoon. But first of all, there's going to be this tension I say that we take a, a step back before diving right into solutions. We want to have a lot of solutions before we say, let's execute on this specific one. But at the same time, there's always this drive for action. So there's going to be a tension as I speak around those two ideas. Taking a step back and make sure, make sure that we're framing the questions in the right way. And also, you know, how do we take action as quick as possible? The second big aspect is creating awareness and empathy. Empathy is a cornerstone of this, and that's really where you all probably excel at, but maybe you don't have the time to really dedicate to either the process or making sure that you can go do that deep dive into the context in which you're trying to face. Also, it utilizes creativity and brainstorming. First and foremost, we're, again, we're looking at the big picture, a lot of ideas before we really dive into one. And again, we make it Whatever that is, we make the it tangible. We want to test small and fail early. That way, we're not investing a ton of money and resources into something that we're not sure is going to succeed and that we can, um, before we affect the lives of you know, hundreds, thousands of people. We, these are high-stakes games that we're all living in with, with the problems that we're facing. 
So we're really trying to say, how can we, instead of investing a lot of time and resources, how can we test it on a small scale and move forward like that? We're also not talking about these lofty goals of, okay, we're gonna brainstorm a lot of ideas, it's not gonna be productive. How many of you have been in a brainstorming session before? I hear some groans like, yeah, that didn't really work. There needs to be excitement around brainstorming, but there also need, there has to be constraints at some point, and these are the big constraints at, at the high level that we work with. The first one is desirability. You know, if we're understanding the deeper needs of the people that we're trying to solve, first and foremost, the solutions that we're creating have to be desirable, or they're not going to be adopted, they're not going to be used. Second thing is viability. You know, do we have the human capital needs, the financial needs, or the financial capital to actually execute on that solution? And the feasibility, obviously, do we have the technology? Are we creating, are, are all of our ideas requiring technology that hasn't been invented yet? Or can we actually use that? So those are kind of the, the easy three constraints that we work with, but we'll come back later and figure out like what those constraints can look like when you're brainstorming. Design thinking really does want to be divergent. We create choices first before we converge on that one. I show this diagram and it's a little misleading. This is more in how the rest of the conversation will progress, but we kind of take it into three forms. You know, the D school at Stanford I think has four or five. You know, IDEO.org we used kind of these three. You know, it depends on the shop that you're at, but in general, everyone has these elements involved with what the design process might look like. Again, this is a mindset and a set of tools, not really a how-to guide at this point. So we start off with inspiration. This idea of how do we do the deep dive, how do we understand the people, and how do we get excited about, you know, we, I, I feel like sometimes we just lose steam. You know, we've been working at this for so many years. And how can we get re-energized and excited about really going and doing good? Then you move into the ideation stage where you're synthesizing all this great information, you're brainstorming solutions, and you're really making it tangible and creating action steps. And really, we're moving back and forth between those a lot the implementate before we even get to the implementation stage, before we go pilot our ideas. So this may look linear, but really, it's like this. <laughs> so we are going back and back and back. Of course, we don't have like tons of time, always tons of resources to designate to these types of processes, these steps. But the idea is that we have to go back to the drawing board sometimes, and that's really where innovation can play a big role. We're not always just saying, okay, this is the idea, let's get, get that grant and let's go. Because most of the information I feel that, like when I worked at the state, or I didn't work at the State Department, when I worked on State Department programs, we would go do a needs assessment for two weeks in XYZ country. We'd come back, based on research and, and that, those two weeks we would develop a program, we'd submit a proposal, we'd get the, the money and we'd go execute, hoping that we were right. And so it needs to be more iterative. It needs to look a little more like this. As I mentioned with IDEO and uh, you know, other design firms, design thinking has been used on projects around the world. I said the mouse, the first laptop, things like this, 3D glasses. Uh, we at IDEO we have a whole toy department, things like that. And it's really, I'm, I'm sure Office Depot in some sense has even used these concepts to innovate in their own product lines. And so we obviously know that it's been used for tangible products, but it's also been used by educators in the classroom. You know, it's this project-based learning. It is how to kind of this create your own adventure. There's a lot of ways to integrate design thinking into education. There's a whole tool, toolkit called Design Thinking for Educators Toolkit that IDEO produced, and it's available free online. Um, and it's also been used throughout the social sector for new services and programs. One thing that I, I love the story around how IDEO kind of went from the, the tangible products and services 
And then they started doing like hotel check-in experience, the less tangible. How does someone go through an entire process? How do you prototype that? How do you get the feedback? And how do you move forward with that? So that's kind of how we've, we've merged into the social sector. And I love this example. This is another kind of intangible, but kind of experiential uh, design. This was an IDEO designer that, if you, I don't know if any of you have heard this story, but we were working with a major hospital chain, and we wanted to find out what the patient experience was. So it's, again, we're creating empathy. What's it like to be in their shoes? This guy checked himself into the hospital and went through the entire emergency room procedure, the experience. Of course, behavior might have been changed a little bit because he had this camera attached to his head. But what do you think, how many of you have ever been in the emergency room? What's the, I mean, how long did it take to, you know, point from point A to point B if it was just kind of in and out? Hours? Hours. And how many of you were in a similar position most of the time? He was on his back in the bed, and he had this camera attached to it. What do you think the camera saw when they went back and looked at the tape? The ceiling. That's not a great experience to be sitting down and looking at probably a water-stained ceiling. You know, the nurse comes in, prods and pokes you, but this whole time you're just looking at this blank or dirty ceiling. Now, that's not incredibly innovative or interesting, and it's kind of that common sense element, but we don't think about it. And so design is about being intentional. We have to sit here and say, okay, what are we really looking at? What are we doing? And so just painting the ceiling or you know, making sure that it's not in disarray can improve the experience just that much, and it has a huge impact. Of course, there were other impl implications for you know, how nurses interact with the patient, but the one thing that I wanted to say was that the ceiling was dirty and gross, and we decided to change that. So just one quick reminder of the, the overall steps, and we're gonna go through some of those steps now. The first one being inspiration, understanding by being empathic learners. This idea of empathy. We could be, we may have worked in these at the same job or the same organizations or on the same issues or we've lived in the same community for many, many years. And so it's really important to come at this with a new lens. And so we call this the beginner's mindset. So as you go kind of do this qualitative research or this empathic design, you always wanna be looking at it through the beginner's mindset. You wanna listen. You want to question everything. You know, you, you say, why? You may, may, for an example, we were working on a cook stove project in Kenya. And, or I think it was Tanzania, sorry. Cook stove project in Tanzania. Cook stove is obviously something that people use to cook with in their homes. There are a lot of health-related risks involved with current models. And we were saying, can we design a cleaner, more efficient one? Well, we found out that there were a lot of reasons why people weren't using the cook stove. But instead of just asking, how do you use a cook stove in your home? We asked them questions like, well, what's your favorite dish to cook? It's this. Why? What, wait, what do you do when you're cooking with it? Why? And we always ask why. It's not a judgment call, it's just going deeper and finding out what motivates people to behave the way they do. And so we're kind of interested in designing for or with or by the people that we're working with. So we can do participatory design so that people are very active in designing it with us, or we might design for, but that's sometimes you know, not always the best option. You also wanna be curious. That comes back to this why that you really are saying, huh, I'm really interested in that. I'm also interested in you, you as a person, and what makes you tick. 
And then finally, you kind of want to, as you start doing that across the board, you want to find out the patterns. What are these things that are emerging that are the common threads? And that will inform your design. So you can do an individual interview. I could sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one. We could maybe talk at a table. Uh, but we also do do in, um, expert interviews. We want to talk to the people that have been in the field. We do ethnography, but sometimes that's ethnography light, if you know what that is. Ethnography is kind of this, I'm going to go live with the people. I'm going to be in the, in the village or in the community. And so we really want to understand that by living with them. But in qualitative research, that's ethnography light. We may go do it for two or three weeks. We're not going to go do it for a year where a qualitative researcher might. And so there are a lot of experts out there that we can go talk to. Um, and also this idea of community-driven dr discovery. We want to be able to say, OK, I'm not the expert here. You are. Can we empower you to go work within your community and report back what's going on? I love this idea. And it's talking to extremes. A lot of times when we're designing a program, we may say, what's the desired behavior? Let's go talk to all of them. But you're going to find a lot more interesting information when you talk to the margins. Um, I had a question actually just earlier this week that a guy works with the elderly. And he wanted to kind of redesign the, the entranceway. Can you have a, a roll up kind of ramp and not stairs, and, and we talked about why that was important, but we really were, he was like, how could I go talk to people? And I said, well, you know, you've got, in the elderly population, you have a lot of different cases. You have people that are, that may have relatively normal diseases, high blood pressure, maybe even diabetes, things like that, that they just live with on a daily basis, but then you may have the extreme on one side, that's hospice, and one extreme on the other where, They've been rocking and rolling for 60, 70 years, and they're moving, they're really mobile. And so being able to understand the different contexts in which they live and how they enter their house or how they live in general, you're going to be able to design a front of the house that will meet all needs. And so we do that a lot. We also focus on workarounds. How many of you, I love this question, how many of you, just raise your hand, Instead of actually going to the closet and hanging up your jacket, throw it on the chair or whatever's nearby. Why is that? We've had, we have a closet that has been designed. We have hangers that have been designed. But we don't do it. So that's a workaround. By throwing it over the chair, that's a workaround. And here's a really great story. So we were doing a project in Mexico around savings. And I don't know how many Spanish speakers we have in the room, but we, in America, usually save for a rainy day or an emergency. And so, you know, we're used to, it's instilled in, instilled in us at a young age that you need to save. You know, you never know when that emergency is coming, and as long as you have some stuff in the bank, it's going to help you get by with whatever. Well, our client was really interested in bringing low-income Mexicans into the formal banking system. You know, it the money may or may not have been safe at home. And as we started doing just our interviews, we were, as, as we talked to them in Spanish, we realized that there was something not resonating, this idea of savings. And so as we dug deeper, we realized how we were translating savings was kind of incorrect and it didn't really resonate with them. So, but what we did find was that they put money away just as we do, but the, the language was different around putting money away versus saving, especially in a bank. And we found out, too, that they don't just put it away for a rainy day or in an emergency. They save for a specific occasion or thing. They save for a wedding, the new TV, a washer and dryer. And we do the same thing, but we're told to you know, save for a rainy day. And so we kind of went in with that mindset thinking, OK, that's how they're going to save. So the workaround, instead of saving in a bank, they have a box on the shelf with different compartments. You know, maybe the one on the, the left is for the wedding. The one on the right is for the TV, whatever. Or they hide money under the mattress. And so that was their workaround from actually saving in a bank. 
And so by understanding that, we said, okay, how might we create a financial product that will be similar to that action? And so we created an ATM that, was a, that allowed them to put money into kind of a, a specific account for different things. This wasn't that complex, guys. I talked about prototyping and testing small failing early. We didn't go create a whole new software for this. We went and used an, an iPad and Keynote software. Keynote's kind of like the Apple version of PowerPoint. And put a plastic box around it. And we went and we sat down with someone, and, and well, many people, and said, how would you use this? What does this you know, look like for you? Does this make sense? We wanted to show, we didn't want to tell. So we were able to gain a lot of feedback and be able to then go read, um, sorry, we will go back and kind of redesign or refine, there we go, refine our idea before we told our client, you know, let's go make all these ATMs. So this is this idea that had we not known, we may have gone down there, we would have been like, guys, they don't save, doesn't work. But we kept pushing deeper and we understood how they save, why they save. And that really informed the product or the service that we could then design. Ideation, this is the fun creative part. You t it's how would you make sense of all of that information and make it into something real? We often do hundreds of interviews. We will post something and literally an add on Craigslist and see who wants to participate sometimes. Um, but we obviously have all of this data and we have to figure out what to do with it. So first, and this is really kind of the bread and butter of it all, and it's the, a really unique skill that I think you have to have in order to be successful with all of this. But there are a lot of tools out there to help you. This is something called an empathy map. So you have all this information, you've written down all your notes, you kind of go through, you highlight what, you've, you, know, what you think is really interesting or important, and then you can literally use a flip chart or butcher paper, put it into things that say, think, see, say, do, hear, feel, and you can start parsing out what those look like. What did they actually say? What are some of the quotes? What did I see, how did I see them behaving? And then you can actually start inferring what you believe too. That's what's interesting about design thinking. It's not just the hard and fast facts, but it's also saying, where can I read between the lines? And once you start doing this, you start seeing the themes that emerge. And you're able to say, okay, the insights. I saw this, and based on my own experiences, my own education, I know this. So what's that insight that I can kind of combine the two? And those really become your design elements. And that's where you can really start funneling down, OK, I want to, how might we redesign the cook stove in Tanzania? That's a really big question. Or how might we help you know, health problems in Tanzania through cook stoves? I mean, that's still a really big problem. But once we have all of this information, we can start kind of funneling it down and making it more specific to say, how might we help women in Tanzania use their cook stoves for something? And, and that's really where you want to go because I have this image up here because there's, you could have this really broad thing that there's gonna be too many ideas that may or may not be relevant to your actual question and then there's so many that could be too narrow that you're not going to get a lot of ideas out of. So there's kind of this just right, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. There's this just right aspect to all of this. But the general formula is how might we help someone with something? This I want to spend a little bit of time on, brainstorming, because brainstorming we had a lot of groans in here. You have to really go in with a specific mindset when you brainstorm to, for it to be productive. 
Could I get just a couple of volunteers to come up here just really quickly? Yes, ma'am, and yes, ma'am. I don't know if we have. Yeah. Yeah. So none of this, I think, really needs a lot of training in order to do. You need to just get out there and talk to the people that you're serving, first and foremost. And, and then, you know, we all can take notes on what we observe and what we see. You don't necessarily have to invite designers into, you know, your organization. They can be really expensive at that. But the idea is just if we're being intentional and having, going, um, solving the problems or addressing the problems through this lens, it may make us take a step back and say, okay, hold on. Are we doing this the right way? Are we really understanding what we're trying to do? So I wanted to take one second. We have Ingrid. Where are you from, Ingrid? From the South Shore, Miami area. From the Miami area. And Vicki from? Fort Lauderdale. From Fort Lauderdale, so locals. Um, I don't know, we may have to stand over there. Can we get the mic on over here? Just because people will need to hear you. I would like them to brainstorm vacation de destinations. So, Vicki, you're going to go first, and you're going to brainstorm vacation destinations. And Ingrid, you're going to say no, and then say something that, give a reason why. Okay? Based on what she says. Based on what she says. Ingrid, would you mind coming up here? Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, Ingrid, I would love to go to Italy. I want to go... Uh, I want to go see Rome again. I want to go back and, and, and see all that history. That sounds good, but I think that um, possibly going to an island and relaxing versus traveling and enduring all of the you know, extracurriculum exercises that Italy would entail. Um, I suggest if you really want to relax, you can go somewhere out on the island and sit under a coconut tree. <laughs> <laughs> One more, Vicki. Okay, all right, so then now we're talking about coconut trees and maybe uh, the Caribbean, somewhere in the Caribbean. I've always wanted to go to the Cayman Islands. That sounds good, but I heard that Dominican Republic has the best <laughs> resorts. <laughs> okay, and now we're gonna switch roles, and Ingrid, you're going to brainstorm, and you just have to sit, give the idea, okay. just say where, and you're going to say yes and give us something that you can do. I've been meaning to go to Alaska to see if it's true, Vicki, that out of, um, I believe, six, six months, it's dark all the time. I'm not too sure, but what do you think? You know what? Yes, and when you're there, you can go um, do those dog mushing things. You can go the, to see the glaciers. There's so much more that you can do than just see that dark stuff, so there's lots to do there. Awesome. Where else would you go? Uh, Cruises. Oh, these Norwegian cruises are spectacular. Yes, and when you're on the cruises, there's lots of gambling all the time and great food. <laughs> great food. Okay. That, I'm going to cut it short. Thank you guys for volunteering. That was a cheesy exercise, but you could see Vicky switch over immediately to yes and and how much she got much more excited. I'm, I would venture if we'd kept that going, Vicki, you probably, on the, when you were say, getting your ideas shot down, it would have become harder and harder to create ideas. And, and Ingrid, I think had you gotten all of the encouragement from Vicki that you needed, you would have been able to like, yeah, and let's do this, and let's do this, and let's go. Let's book our flights today. So I think that's really where I know. I, I was actually at an NPR affiliate in Austin last week, and I heard this, I, this, the report out from a brainstorming session, and it immediately turned to, we've done this, no, we can't do this because, you know, we don't have the budget, blah, blah, blah. And so if you can go into brainstorming with 
yes and, I think that's going to change the whole dynamic. And that's actually just a technique that's borrowed from improv acting. You know, if, if I say yes and, let's go there, that's, that's where that comes from. Another thing is go for quantity. Remember, we're divergent at this point. We want as many ideas as possible. You want to build on the ideas of others. That's, again, yes and. One conversation at a time. You know, you can get excited, but you want to keep it kind of organized. Short and concise. That's another thing. When you're brainstorming, instead of, you don't need a lot of explanation because everyone's on board that this is a, you know, this is an idea that's been put out on the table. Where innovation can happen is encouraging these wild ideas. I had some students back at the University of Texas. We were brainstorming, how might we redesign the mobile blood drive for our students on campus? A mobile blood drive, if you don't know, is kind of, they have this RV that goes to different places and you get on the bus and you get blood. And so we were saying, what are some wild ideas? And they brainstormed, well, what if, based on the information that they'd already gathered, what if we made the exterior of the, the RV, what if we made that a plexiglass so you could see in? And some people are like, whoa, that'd be gross, and I don't want to see that while I'm waiting. <laughs> but other, I mean, that's still a wild idea. And had we not tried to get as many ideas as possible, we would have probably been stuck with some kind of incremental improvement idea or something that really, or maybe none at all, not, no productive ideas. And so if you go in with yes and, you're going to be much better off. We, al we also really want you to be visual. That's making the it tangible. Instead of just writing on your post-it note, um, I want to make this a you know, see-through RV, draw it. It doesn't matter if you're good or not, but draw it. Make it something that I can actually wrap my brain around. And that helps it create, go from like this lofty idea to something that could be actionable because you start your mind just works in a very different way. And of course, stay on topic, which I would guarantee all of us have witnessed brainstorming sessions that kind of veer off into no man's land. I don't know how much time we have. I don't, I'm okay. So implementation and prototyping and storytelling. This is where we really want to make the it tangible. And this is where the tension between taking a step back, making sure that we're identifying the right problems, asking the right questions, and moving as fast to action as we can, that's where this tension kind of comes in because we actually were able to, sometimes we prototype before we even go ask people what they are wanting, what they need, because we want to present them ideas and get their feedback on them as quickly as possible. Just a reminder of where we are in the process. And so this, which is really simple, easy, marker, film canister, which you all probably remember. When I teach you know, graduate and undergraduate students, sometimes they're like, what's a film canister? <laughs> and kind of this chip clip. So I remember the story around this was that they were, they, were they were brainstorming these ideas around some medical device. And they said, OK, what, what if this and this? And they kind of made this kind of like, so you would hold it like this. And, and it really sparked the conversation to help make it actionable and say, OK, so if this is where we're going, what does it look like here? And, and so as, fa as soon as you can make it something that you can interact with, whether it's a picture or a model or your role playing, then it's going to be more productive. So it's just interesting. I mean, this is a very advanced medical device, but it started out as that. Crude, cheap, dirty, whatever. And so, again, it's prototypes are something that you can interact with. And in our fields, we're not going to be necessarily put the marker and the film canister and the chip clip together because that's not really relevant to us. We work a lot with the intangible aspects of all of this. And so that's where storyboards can really come in. Um, a storyboard, if, for, if you're not familiar with it, is just what people use, especially for films, that where they draw each scene and like what would it really look like as you play it out. And that's really helpful for us when you're designing a new process or a system. I'm going to show an example next of that. Models, that's kind of the, the chip clip marker example. 
role play. You know, have someone, you know, if you're in your brainstorming session, you're like, that's a really good idea. How would that work? Brainstorm what it would actually look like, set it up, bring someone in from, you know, the next office and, and kind of walk them through the process. It really is a fruitful exercise to get feedback immediately. And I think that's something that you guys could really do instead of just, okay, we have this idea, who's in charge of making that happen? You make it happen in the room. So, and diagrams, you can create frameworks, you can do Venn diagrams, you can see what the process looks like on the board, whatever, but again, it's this idea of what can you interact with that will help your brain actually say, okay, I don't understand this aspect and start the conversation. Early and often, you wanna keep iterating, you wanna improve it as much as possible, you wanna move fast. When possible, show, don't tell. You know, if you have to explain it too much, it's not a good design. I see a lot, I, I feel like in the sector that we work in, if you have to explain, okay, come to our office, we do this, blah, 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 I mean, some instructions are good, but if, it, if there's too many questions, it's probably not a good design. And could you have addressed that when you were interacting with a prototype earlier on in your process? And again, get feedback. So this is our water business in Kenya. This was a project with Unilever and Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor. It's a project we worked on in Nairobi. This is you know, a prototype. This is an example where we kind of sat down and brainstormed ideas before we went to the country. And we said, the, the how might we question, the broad level was, how might we create a, a clean water business for low income Kenyans? It's really broad, you know, that doesn't really help us a lot. But we said, okay, what if we created a business and it, we kind of talked about it in terms of we could do a kiosk, maybe there's a wagon with the jerry cans full of water that you deliver to the homes. So we, we just sketched it out. We sketched it out at home back in San Francisco before we went to Kenya. But when we were in Kenya, we actually rented a guy's kiosk in a slum in Nairobi. We paid him his wage that he would have earned for the day, and we set up shop. And so this, this prototype turned into an expanded prototype of this. We, when we got there, we spray painted some signs with you know, a proposed logo, and the first step was just setting up the kiosk. And we said, maybe people will show up Maybe they'll at least be interested in finding out why the guy's not there anymore. And we just wanted to start the conversation. And we said, yeah, like we're looking at creating this business, we're really interested in this, you know, and we just started the conversation. And the next day, we said, okay, we've got some information, where, you know, what can we do with this? And so we started talking to some of those folks that had come up to us, we, we had asked them in advance, we're like, can we come talk to you some more? And we, we found out, here, here are some of those things about insights. In a place where, you know, there's not a lot of trust with new things popping up because there's corruption and, and scams, we found that people actually are willing to pay in advance for this type of service. And that was only possible by creating these touch points building trust. We figured out that they trust strong brands like Coca-Cola and things like this because when you are in Nairobi and you see a project by USAID, the US Agency for International Development, or a foundation or whatever, there's no guarantee that the money will be there in two years. You know, the project may be cut, whatever, and so like from the Kenyan perspective, that service they may not take advantage of because it's not gonna be there, why would I actually invest my time and energy in getting that service when it's not gonna be there in a couple years? But if it's some regular market product or another project sponsored by a strong brand, then if there's a market response, they know that Coca-Cola, Unilever, whomever, is going to say, yes, let's make that something in, in a product line of our business. And what I love about this is just, we went in with an idea, 
This didn't cost hardly anything to just go test it. I mean, travel to Kenya was expensive. But we, we, you know, there, it was kind of low risk. If we failed at that idea, we could go back to the drawing board and, and move, and move quickly. But the idea was getting feedback, getting to know people. Was clean water in general, you know, good, regular clean water for washing or household items, was that the driver? Or was it clean drinking water? And only by being on the ground, understanding the people, we realized clean drinking water is always the driver. And that informed the, the service that we were providing. And so if you're working in your field and you have an assumption, you should challenge it. You should verify that that's actually relevant or true. And go test it. So another, I, I've had a lot of international examples because that's my background, but I wanted to be able to bring up a domestic example. This project was actually being, it was started when I was still at IDEO.org, but I didn't get to see it all the way through, so I've had to follow up. But this was the Community Action Project in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I don't know if any of you have heard of it or if you're from Oklahoma. The, the objectives were to understand the, the families that were involved in the program and their level of engagement with their child's development. I think there's an assumption often when working with low-income people that they're not as invested in their child's develop their children's development as someone like us would be. Right or wrong, um, it's an assumption and we wanted to test that. And so we also wanted to see how we could make, you know, we've got these services, right? Many of which you offer probably similar services, like free tax, um, I'm blanking on the word. Pardon? Yes. So, you know, tax help, we're working on, you know, parenting classes, whatever, but we've always had these ideas that these are needs that these people have, let's create a program and, you know, let's offer them. And people will show up and use our service or product. Well, Community Action Project kind of found that our tax help was really, really needed and used. Parenting classes, not so much. And they wanted to find out why. And so we went in there and we, we helped and they said, well, and then not just the why, but how can we improve? And so, again, there's this, there was this assumption that we don't, you know, or they weren't as invested in, you know, using the service because they weren't in, invested in their children's development, blah, blah, blah. But really, the, the idea was that they weren't comfortable. They weren't comfortable using the service. You know, you have to get your taxes done, period, the end. So there was a free service that was pretty easy to use. They went to that. But they, they weren't understanding that there's kind of a, a risk involved with going and being seen that you're getting help. And it was only by getting in there and talking to people, obviously they're super invested in their children's development and seeing them succeed, but it was going into this community, going that they work with and talking to people that, and understanding that, I, you know, I don't necessarily want to be seen in this or doing this, but what helped was we were like, through our, you know, after our data collection, we prototyped a couple of ideas, and one was this point system. We were able to say, Okay, you know, just like the coffee shop, you get 10 punches, you get a free um, coffee. Well, what if we have a point system for using more services, kind of that incentive, that said you get, you know, however, however many points it is, five, 100 or whatever, and you get to go to the spa, you get to have mom day, or you get to, you know, do something for your children, you know, whatever that incentive was, but based on the point system. So we kind of used existing things that were happening. You know, the punch card idea or the point system is already out there in the world, but how could we be innovative and use it for this? And it really worked. It broke down some of that barrier of, I, you know, maybe it was, didn't break down the barrier of the risk or being seen, but there was actually a reason well, like, could be a little selfish, or it could have been for the teachers, it does, or the, the students, it doesn't matter, but that I'm, getting an incentive to use these services, and it's benefiting society. It's ben benefiting the people that I'm trying to serve. And so that was really insightful, but that we actually prototyped several things. So this one kind of worked, and this one didn't. 
we thought, okay, there are some people using our services, CAP, and they're really seeing the benefit in them. And you know, they've got these incredible stories. What if we kind of publicize that? And we, put, uh, we, we did these posters, put them in bus stops, and you know, they said, like, you know, Maria is doing really well, and she's, you know, this is her story. Text her and give her encouragement. Say, keep on, keep, keep on keeping on, and you know, do your thing. It didn't work. They got one text message. But why I use this example is that seems really likely that a social service organization would use. Would think, we need this communications campaign. And OK, you, you invest the time and money in this big campaign, and then you get one text message. We were able to do you know, four or five posters, which you know, aren't that expensive to do. And we found it didn't work. So we either went back to the drawing board and, or, and said, what, what didn't work? Do the, the assessment of why? And we, at the same time, we had this other successful kind of program going on with the points. And it was just testing these ideas. I mean, they were relatively low risk, low cost. And that's really where I want to kind of start ending up. But the last thing is storytelling. Storytelling is so important in this field. It's really sharing best practices. I mean, this is the collaboration aspect. We should be sharing best practices, but we should also be sharing failures. You know, we should be learning from each other. We should be assessing like why it didn't work. We have so much duplication in the, the social sector. And you know, you've got your donors over here, you've got our donors over here. But really, you know, why what's working, what's not? And if you're we're doing the same thing, we should at least be sharing our knowledge, even if we're, you know, doing if we should be merging, probably. But storytelling is so powerful for fundraising because it can get people to buy your product or service. It can get people to get involved with your project. And it can get people to fund your project. And we could go long, long time about what makes a good story. I feel like there are probably better people in this room to talk about that that are communications professionals. But storytelling is so important to design thinking that you want to be able to convince people to get on board. We, we talk about the school bus pro, uh, dilemma. Sometimes you, know, you get a new executive director or you get you know, some new people in and out of your organization. A good story can help kind of keep the momentum and keep the, the stream of consciousness going a little bit. That people get on the bus, people get off the bus, but a good story can help people enter and exit at and not lose momentum. It's also a great synthesis tool. You know, if you're out doing your interviews and, or you're out observing, you know, people in context, then you can come back and kind of parcel out your notes and say, what's the story behind what I just witnessed or what I just learned. And so that, I think, is really powerful. Then you can go back and say, OK, what does that empathy map look like? Challenge assumptions, discover opportunities, and always create value. And you can use a lot of these techniques, but it always needs to be rooted in empathy and really understanding those that we're serving. And I think that's really where we're going to see a lot more innovation in the social sector than this linear thinking that we're already on.